everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to Deschutes Public Library's virtual programming. I'm Liz Goodrich, part of the community relations team. Um, I'd like to introduce Chuck Gates. He is a former board member of the Oregon Field or Ornithologists, now called the Oregon Birding Association, and founding board member and past president of the East Cascades Audubon Society. He is the creator and curator of Birding Oregon website, regional field notes editor for Oregon Birds Magazine, and the leader of the Prineville Bird Club. So please welcome Chuck, and I'm gonna invite you to share your screen and let's get started. All right, good deal. Um, well, um, hello, Deschutes Public Library. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk to you about beginning birding. It's something that I, I don't get a chance to talk about very often, but uh, uh, because we're, I'm usually given presentations on different kinds of birds or bird behavior or anything like that. This is the first time I've actually given one to a group of novices that uh, are just interested in beginning. And I'm very excited about that because uh, if you do choose to begin, become a beginning birder and get into this uh, little thing we call birding, I think you'll really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun for me anyway. And, uh, and I think you'll, you'll really love it. Um, let's just go ahead and dive right on in. Uh, before I do though, uh, make sure you understand that this uh, program is being recorded so you can go back at any time, if you uh, if we throw some information at you and you don't have enough time to process it at all, uh, it'll be on the website. You can go back and uh, check it out and go a little bit slower and pick some things up. One thing I might point out is that my email address is on the front slide here and also my phone number. So if you have questions about birds or if you find a, a bird that you uh, that you don't know or you think might be a rare bird or something like that, feel free to call and contact me. I enjoy uh, when people uh, ask me questions and, and let me know if they're seeing good birds. Uh, I thought I would go through the sort of a table of contents here and, and uh, uh, see, give you an idea of some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, well, we're going to start off with a little bit of uh, what is birding and what's the difference between birding and bird watching. And then uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about how do you begin birding. And we'll talk about keeping records and how to attract birds to your yard and, and how do you get started getting away from your yard and seeing birds in other areas. And then we'll talk about how do I get better once you get started, how do you get better and better? And we'll, we'll go through some of the basic tips on that. We'll talk a little bit about some equipment. We'll, um, we'll mention binoculars and uh, we, won't, we won't talk about all the equipment. We'll just go through the basics anyway and we'll mostly concentrate on binoculars and field guides. And then uh, we'll talk about where you should go. And I'll tell you some local spots that you may already know uh, and how you can get uh, directions to those spots. And then we'll talk about when do you go, what time of day is best and what time of year is best. And then at the end, we'll talk about why do you bird in the first place. And uh, as Liz mentioned, we were, uh, we'll probably talk a little bit about, I uh, probably won't, I'm sorry, not probably, but we will uh, show you some slides at the end. And we'll give you a chance to be a birder and see if you can identify them or uh, uh, maybe look them up real quick or something like that. We'll see how that goes. Okay, so uh, we have this thing called birding and uh, it used to be called bird watching. Uh, we don't use that term very much anymore. There are still people that consider themselves bird watchers. Uh, and a bird watcher uh, in, in most, most people's minds anyway, is someone who enjoys birds, someone who is a casual observer of birds and enjoys the beauty of birds. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's not that these are two levels of birding or anything like that. It's just two kind of different things. Uh, what I generally do and what most of my friends do is what we call birdie. And it's a little bit uh, more intense than than what you might consider bird watching might be. Uh, it involves a little bit of academics. So in the academics, we mess with, with uh, problems in identification, bird biology, uh, some other, um, I'm trying to see if I can move my screen here a little bit. Doesn't look like I can. Um, uh, travel to different countries, uh, keeping track of different uh, lists that you might have and things like that, and participating in some citizen science projects. Uh, so we do uh, kind of in a little sort of bird watching on steroids. That's what birding is. And that's what um, my friends and I do much, a lot of. It's what's most fun for us anyway. And so uh, we'll be talking about birding today. Not so much bird watching, but birding in general. And, and I don't want to scare you off here either because uh, birding is not just for really advanced birding people. It's 
you can, as, a, as you'll see, uh, there are beginning birders and there are advanced birders and there are everything in between. So how do you begin? How do you, let's say you have an interest in birds. Most people begin by having bird feeders in their yard. They want to, they, they enjoy nature and they love the beauty of nature. And so they buy bird feeders and, and then they want to know, well, what are those things called? And that's, that's when you start catching the bug when you want to identify the birds in your bird feeder. Um, and there are lots of things that can happen after that. And how do you get started? Well, sometimes it happens by going on a trip. A uh, picture in the upper left there is my wife in the Caribbean uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, she's not a beginner birder by any stretch of the imagination. She's been birding pretty hard for about 35 years. But, uh, but some people, uh, that's where they catch the bug is that they travel around the world and they run into different birds. Uh, some people just catch birds right in their backyard. The, the top center picture there is a mountain chickadee taken at the waterfall in my water feature right in my backyard. Uh, by the way, most of the bird pictures in this presentation are bird pictures that I took uh, right here in Central Oregon. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions and I'll tell you where they are, but most of them are right in Central Oregon and a good chunk of them, and I did this on purpose, a good portion of the photos that you'll see today were taken right in my backyard. So I, I want you to know that a lot of what you'll see, they're gonna be kind of spectacular. They're very gorgeous. Uh, uh, but uh, they're not that unusual that you can get them right in your own yard. The bird in the upper right-hand corner is a northern flicker, and uh, this bird is our most common woodpecker, and that bird can be found uh, right in your yard all the time. It's a bird that, a woodpecker that spends a lot of time on the ground because it eats ants, and uh, that, that guy's one of our most common uh, visitors. So you can get birds that come to your house, and that will get you started, or you can get birds that you see on trips somewhere that might get you started. Some people get started by seeing birds on the internet or seeing birds in, in guides. And one of the very first things I would encourage you to do is to buy a field guide. And we're going to talk about field guides here in a second, but field guides are very important. That's the little books down on the far right that you they're They're called field guides because they're shaped. So they'll fit in your back pocket and you can take them out in the field with you and you can get them, whip them out real quick and try to identify birds as they're, uh, working their way around you. And those field guides are pretty important as I'll, I'll, I'll get to in just a bit uh, because they're the, your sort of your conduit into the world of, boot, of birding. And uh, the, that's how you're going to be able to identify most of your birds. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about basic equipment. I have three pictures here. One of them is pretty embarrassing. The first one on the left, my rain pants lost their suspenders. And so they were kind of coming down around my ankles there. But I, I put that photo in there because I, I wanted to show you that I walk around laden with equipment all the time because it helps me bird. But uh, I want you to, to understand that, that you don't have to buy all that expensive, crazy equipment. Um, on the picture on the left, I have a spotting scope, and a big camera. You can't see my binoculars hanging in front of me, but they're there. And I have probably a speaker in my pocket. I have a cell phone that I use to record uh, birds on. So I have all kinds of technology with me, but it's not really that necessary to have all of that stuff. We'll talk about what you need in just a second. But the basic equipment is going to be uh, in the center picture. You can see my binoculars there hanging from my neck. And uh, in the right side uh, page, you can see some big cameras there on the right side. Uh, on the right side, we're up in the Wallawa Mountains taking photographs of, uh, of small birds in, in some teasel there and uh, in the snow. Uh, and, and you know, that, that all that big equipment that I have is cost an arm and a leg. It's just not all that important. What's important is to get the basic equipment. Basic equipment is gonna be binoculars and field guide. Binoculars so you can see better. And some people would say, well, I just wanna see it with my naked eye, but everything is better, bigger, as long as it's bigger and clearer. And that's what binoculars do for you. Binoculars uh, magnify the image, bring it in closer to you so you can see the, the birds better, be able to identify them and see the actual beauty of, of the birds. And then the field guides again are there to be able to tell you how to identify the birds, what their names are, and uh, maybe sometimes which families they belong to if you get interested in that kind of thing. So we're gonna talk a little bit about field guides and the picture in the upper left there is a picture I took today of my, of my bookcase. Um, I have two shelves of field guides. And uh, some of them, as you, if you could look in close, they're, they're field guides from 
all over the world there. But um, I also have a bunch of field guides just from the local area. It, it's not as important these days to have a whole bunch of field guides as it used to be when I began buying field guides 20 years ago and 25 years ago, 30 years ago, sorry. And um, uh, really, I, these things that all most of these field guides that I have in my bookshelf sort of collect dust because we are in the world of technology these days. And, uh, and you can get field guides right online. You can get field guides right on your phone. There are lots and lots of, uh, of uh, field guide apps that you can buy from your app store. And uh, some of them are relatively inexpensive, $10 maybe. Uh, some of them maybe a little less than that. Uh, but, but the good quality ones are going to be between $10 and $15 to buy a bird app. Uh, or you can go online if you have a desktop at home and you, and you, uh, you want to look at some birds there. You can go to a site called All About Birds, which is the banner right below my, the picture of my uh, bookshelf there. And uh, you can go on all that All About Birds site. Uh, it's just a website and, and it'll, you can enter in the names of birds or search for birds and things like that. And then you have, uh, if you're going to buy a book and, and some people just like to have books, I do. I like to have a book with me. Uh, there, are, there are a number of books. In fact, it's a bit uh, mind numbing to go to the, one of the bookstores and look at the uh, field guide sections and see uh, all the different kinds of field guides that there are. Uh, be careful when you're buying field guides that you don't buy a field guide for the Eastern United States because the birds are not the same in Boston as they are here in, in Bend, Oregon. So uh, be real careful that you buy a, a field guide that it's either for the entire uh, continent of North America, uh, which uh, there are uh, field guides for North America, or therefore Western North America, not, not Eastern, because you'll be disappointed if you buy spend $30 on a, on a field guide for birds of the east. So that center picture there is a, a field guide called the Sibley Guide, uh, and that's the Sibley Guide to the birds of the west, and that's the one that you would want to buy if you were going to buy a Sibley Guide, and that's the, the Sibley Guide is the one that I recommend. I think it does the best job. It has the best photo, best pictures. It doesn't use photos. Uh, Sibley is a, an artist. He paints his own, all of his own bird pictures for his field guides, but uh, he's just fantastic. One of the one of the best birders in the country uh, is uh, David Ellis Sibley. So, um, you know, it's it's just uh, the best quality field guide is probably the Sibley guide, and the, the one on the right side there is the big Sibley guide, which is the big Sibley guide of North America. All the birds in all of North America, Canada, the United States, and and uh, parts of northern Mexico, anyway. So you have. Uh, book field guides that you can get to you have online field guides you can get to and as you might guess uh, there's an app for that too uh, here we have a, a little app called merlin that you can download merlin is free uh, you can go into your app store and just uh, search for the merlin bird app or the merlin id app or something like that and and this uh, merlin app will come up and you can download it for free and then uh, it, it goes through a process or takes you through a process that helps you identify the bird yourself. It'll ask you how big is the bird? What color is the bird? What's the bird doing? What kind of habitat's in? It gathers information and then it'll give you a series of photos and go, I think it's this one or this one or this one. And it's, so rather than just taking a picture and, and uh, telling you what it is, it helps you work through the process of identifying it. And it's actually very, very useful. It's very, very popular. Lots and lots of people that be, that are beginning birders uh, really eat this app up. That's it's their favorite app. So uh, I would suggest that if you're going to become a beginning birder, that you uh, that you get the Merlin app. It's really nice. If you want to, you can snap a photo with your phone and and hook that photo or import that photo into Merlin, and Merlin will tell you what it is. So it does have that function and capability, but. Uh, I think it's better to work your way through and try to be able to identify it. You learn better that way. That bird, by the way, in the upper left, that little orange and black bird is a Blackburnian warbler. And it's not a warbler that we get here in Bend very often. Um, it's, it's an Eastern warbler. It's usually found on the other side of the Rocky Mountains. So consider um, downloading the Merlin app if you want to become a beginning birder.
The next thing um, is when you first begin is that you need to buy a pair of binoculars. And, and, I, and I just, I'm just going to flat say that you have to have them. You're, you're simply not going to be successful, uh, successful in any way. And you're not going to be satisfied in any way. I, I don't think most people will anyway, uh, if you don't buy a pair of binoculars. These guys bring the bird closer to you, give you an idea of the, uh, some of the beauty and the details that are that make up the beauty of these birds. And it's just essential that you have these guys. You don't have to spend an arm and a leg. You can spend an arm and a leg. Uh, there are binoculars out there that cost more than $3,000, uh, open market binoculars. Uh, there are binoculars out there that cost under $20. Um, I would steer you away from either one of those as a beginning birder. Uh, but I will tell you that that uh, that there are some basic caveats here. One is that uh, you certainly get what you pay for with binoculars. Uh, if you buy a twenty dollars pair of binoculars, uh, you're going to get a twenty dollars pair of binoculars, and they are they're not going to last. They're not going to give you very good views, and you're going to be very frustrated, and you're going to waste your twenty dollars. Um, people all the time ask me how much should I spend, and, and I always tell them, well. You spend as much as you can and spend as much as you, you feel like you want to spend for a pair of binoculars and don't don't cheap up as much as you as you want to sometimes, because the more you spend, the better it gets. Now, I want to I want to uh, sort of uh, <laughs> put another caveat in there, too. Uh, you do the, the more you spend, the better it gets is a true statement, but it's not a straight line factor. It's not a straight line thing uh, as you get higher and higher in price the quality start, the improvement in quality uh, starts to diminish. So a pair of binoculars that are $3,000 uh, are not twice as good as a pair of binoculars that are $1,500. Uh, $1,500 binoculars are nearly as good as $3,000 binoculars. And you're probably going, 1,500, I would never, and you're right. I wouldn't blame you. Uh, I would say that if, if you can, and this may shock some of you, but if you can spend $500, that's a really good pair of binoculars that will last you a long time. Uh, one of the things that you really want to do is, is make sure that when you read the specs on your binoculars and check them out or ask the clerk who's helping you, make sure that they have a lifetime warranty. It's worth the wait. Some do and some don't. And the one that you, the pair that you want may not have it, but it's worth the wait because a lifetime warranty means that you drop your binoculars that's off, you know, that is, or lay them on the hood of your car, which I've done many times and they fall off and break. Then you just send them in and they send you either a, a fixed repaired set of binoculars, or they'll send you a new pair of binoculars. And you don't have to buy a new pair every time you, you damage one. Uh, if you don't have that lifetime warranty, then you're going to be spending a lot of money in repairs because yeah, the the less you pay for binoculars, the the less rugged they are as well. And so if you're going to have to, again, you'll probably start at a lower end price level and just dropping those things often will, will ruin them. So um, it, it's worth it to look around for a pair of binoculars that have uh, a lifetime warranty. Another thing you definitely want to do with a pair of binoculars is you want to have, they want, you want them to be waterproof and, and make sure it says waterproof, not water resistant. Water resistant just means it's kind of going to mess up real bad, <laughs> but it's still going to mess up real bad. So uh, you don't want water inside your binoculars. You're just done for the day if that happens. So uh, uh, you don't want that to happen. You want waterproof binoculars. Let's take a look at some of the pictures on this slide so we can explain a couple of things. There are two main kinds of binoculars. Uh, one of them is called a roof prism binocular. And you can tell the roof prism binoculars because the two, it looks like two tubes taped together. They're, the tubes are in a straight line. The light passes through those tubes in roughly a straight line. And, uh, and there, there aren't, there's not a lot of, uh, of uh, ins and outs to the outside of the binoculars anyway. It's just two tubes hooked together by a hinge. That's the roof prism. The poro prism has two tubes and the eyepieces are, are then inset a little bit from the two, two tubes. So you kind of go in a straight line with the, with the uh, uh, ocular lenses out on the end. And then the light sort of goes through a little jig pattern and uh, goes through some kind of whoop-de-doos and uh, then eventually gets to your eyes. And the eyepieces that you're looking through are not directly uh, 
uh, lined up with the objective lenses out on the uh, other end. Um, as, for, as for which of these are better, well, it's a little hard to say. It kind of depends. There are, there are roof prism binoculars that are way better than some poro prisms, and there are poro prisms that are way better than some roof prisms. Overall, uh, more than like more, most of the really good binoculars are roof prism binoculars, mainly because the roof prism binoculars are uh, you can make them uh, in the process of manufacturing them, you can make them way much less. And so people are a little turned off by the poro prisms because they're pretty heavy, and the roof prisms are lighter, and so they're much more popular. But there really isn't that much difference in the quality. If you buy a, a poro prism, that that costs six hundred dollars, and you buy a roof prism that costs six hundred dollars. The quality is probably pretty similar. Uh, we want to go take a look at the picture. That's the central picture in the uh, middle of the slide. Above that picture, it says central focus knob. Most binoculars, and and in in if you buy a new pair of binoculars now, it's virtually all binoculars have a focus knob right in the middle between the two tubes. And that's called the central focus knob. And all you do is turn that as you're looking through the binoculars, you uh, turn that thing back and forth until the image that you're looking at comes into focus. So with just a little bit of practice, uh, you become pretty quick at that and pretty good at it. In fact, you don't even think about it. You, uh, once you get using binoculars a little bit, you just raise those up to your eyes and um, immediately your fingers uh, get to moving and they, they bring the image right into focus. So that's how you focus your binoculars. If, you, if I can draw your attention to the bottom left, there are two pictures there of the eyepieces of binoculars. Um, one of them uh, on the left there has a, a, a little knob and it says Nikon on it. That's the, that's the central focus knob. That's the knob that you focus your binoculars with. But there's also on the right hand eyepiece, there is also a little dial that you can turn. And this is true for almost all modern binoculars. On the right-hand eyepiece, there's a little dial that you can turn, or in some cases, you have to grab that little central focus knob that says Nikon, and you have to pop it out or pull it out uh, to be able to set this thing. And these, anyway, these little dials that are on the eyepieces are called diopters. And the diopter, what it does for you is that allows you to uh, set your micro, your uh, binoculars to match your own individual eyes. Yeah, most of you know you have two eyes, but you may not know that neither of your eyes are exactly the same. And so what you can do is, is set the focus for both of your eyes individually and to get the most, the maximum clarity on the image that you're looking through the binoculars at. So uh, what you end up doing is uh, picking up your binoculars for the first time. You'll close your right eye, which is where the, di the diopter is on the right side. You'll close your right eye, and now you'll use the central focus knob, and you'll set, you just put the binoculars on an item like this, a stop sign or a tree branch, and put it on that item, and then turn the central focus knob until the object comes into focus with your left eye. At that point, then close your left eye, and now you only have your right eye open, and you're looking through the right side where the diopter is. Now turn the diopter to focus your right eye. And now you have your left eye set for your left lens and your right eye set for your right lens. Your two eyes, even though they may focus differently, are now individually focused into your binoculars, and you'll be able to see quite clearly. Uh, that's kind of uh, everything you always wanted to know about binoculars. A little, a little uh, short. Oh, good. I can move that. Good. I don't want to miss anything over here. So uh, adjust your eyes with the diopter. People say, well, what do those numbers mean? On the binoculars, you have 8 by 42, 10 by 52, 8 by 25. Well, the two numbers mean two different things. The first number is the number uh, is the amount of magnification that your binoculars get. And so an 8 by 42, the 8 means that it magnifies the image eight times. It's eight times bigger than it is in real life. So if you look out and there's a little tiny bird on a, on a branch that you can't see very well, you bring up your binoculars to your eyes and it will magnify that little tiny bird eight times and then you'll be able to see it fairly well. The 42 or the second number is the, is the uh, diameter of the, uh, of the objective lens on the other side. On the, the, not the eye, the eyepiece lenses that you look through, but the lenses on the other side of the binocular, the other end of the binocular. And, and the number 
indicates how many millimeters it is across the field of view of that binocular. The bigger that number, the bigger that uh, lens is that's on the other side of your binocular. Uh, and the bigger the lens is, the more light it gathers. And the more light it gathers, the better you can see. So you would think that like an eight by a hundred would be great, which, which it would be great, except for the problem is eight by hundreds weigh about 40 pounds. And you have to walk around with those things uh, strapped around your neck for about an hour, you're gonna, your neck's gonna fall off. So uh, there's a limit to how big those, uh, those lenses end up being. But the first number anyway is magnification. The second number is the, the diameter of the far lens, not the eyepiece lens, but the far lens farthest away from your eyes. And, and uh, the bigger the number on the first number, the bigger the magnification, the bigger the number on the second number is, means you gather more light and can see a little bit better. Um, people say, what should I get? And the answer is, uh, it kind of depends a little bit on, on how uh, strong you are. Uh, if you're a relatively small person and you have a relatively weak neck, uh, then you probably want to stay away from the 10 by 50s. They're really heavy and your neck gets really tired and you won't want to wear your binoculars very long. And, and that's the key is to have them with you. You never know when you need them. So there, it's nice to have a pair that you don't even feel. Uh, but an eight by 25 is a really small sort of an individual pair and eight by 25 doesn't gather very much light. 25 millimeters is very small and you're not going to see very well with 25 millimeters. So you're going to be discouraged because you're going to, you're going to see a bird, but you can't really see any detail with an eight by 25. So that brings us really to uh, an eight by 42. Eight by 42 is really the standard for most birders uh, to use uh, the size of binoculars to use anyway. Uh, it's right in the middle. It's just the right magnification, just the right uh, uh, amount of light being gathered with that 42 millimeters. And it's not too darn heavy to pack around all day for most people. So that's the size that I recommend. Uh, and we mentioned before, how much should you spend? And not, like I said, I think, I think if you can spend $500, spend $500. If you can't, then, then 300 is better than 200. If you can't do 300, 200 is better than 100. And 100 is better than 50. It's just, it, you know, you really do get what you pay for. And then um, as far as what to buy and where to buy, my, my suggestion is go someplace where you can try some binoculars, not just go online and buy some because it, you'll be surprised how important it is that your binoculars feel good in your hand and feel good when they come up to your eyes. Uh, it's just really important because you're gonna be, if you're birding with them a lot anyway, you're gonna be using them a lot. And so they're, they're sort of like, if you get a pair that's not very comfortable, it's like having an uncomfortable bicycle that you have to ride every day. It just bugs you. And so it's worth uh, trying some on and see which ones feel better, feel better in your hands, and feel better in uh, bringing them up to your eyes. And as far as where to go, uh, I think in Bend, there are two places that I steer people toward. And my apologies, uh, my apologies to uh, any other retailers that are out there. I just don't know about you probably. But uh, Sportsman's Warehouse has a big selection of uh, binoculars uh, to look through. And uh, I would recommend those guys going and trying some there. And uh, the Wild Bird Store, uh, out on the, the mall, out on the Burns Highway, Highway 20, um, out by Costco. That place has a lot of good, nice little binoculars for you to try out as well. So there's two places for you to take a look uh, at binoc binoculars. And then if you have questions about binoculars, then go ahead and throw them in the, uh, the, the question pile or chat box or wherever we're putting them. Okay, uh, then once you, uh, once you get a pair of binoculars and you have a field guide, uh, then the next thing that people begin to do is they begin to get out in the field and they start kind of finding birds. And one of the things you'll find is that there are a lot of birds out there. Oregon has about 500 species of birds and, uh, it, and it's hard to keep track of all of them. So you tend to write them down and that begins your life as a, as a record keeper. And it's one of the characteristics of being a birder is that you record what you see. And that used to entail writing everything in a notebook. Today, most of it's done with your phone. And most of it's done with apps on your phone that record um, your bird sightings. And that's really important because uh, uh, what we're doing today is, uh, is much different than what we would do 
30, 40 years ago when I first started. 30, 40 years ago, there were a lot of amateurs like myself and like you that are out uh, looking at birds throughout the day, finding birds everywhere, writing those birds down. But those notebooks that they write those birds in eventually just get thrown away when those people when those people would pass on. And, and nothing would ever happen of all those records. And for generations, that's what happened. All that information was simply burned at the end of their life. And uh, now uh, you can take all of the information that you have that you gather and you can enter it into th these programs, the most popular of which is called eBird. You can see that uh, the picture of that Wilson's fowler rope up in the upper left-hand corner there above the word eBird. And eBird is a, a uh, electronic uh, sort of data collection uh, site that sounds sounds scary data collection, but it's really not. It's a way for you to keep track of the birds that you're seeing and keep track. Uh, you can use it every day or once a week or once a year. It doesn't really matter however you want to. But the nice thing about it is that not only are you keeping track of what you see and collecting what you see and, and being able to go back and and find that information again. You're also contributing to citizen science around the world on, on bird populations. And, uh, and, and you'll make mistakes, things will happen, you'll enter the wrong name, things like that. But eBird has a whole cadre of, uh, of reviewers that look through the, the entries and they look for mistakes and they're, they're, they're most of the time pretty nice. Not always, but most of the time they're pretty nice and they'll say, um, I think you might have misidentified this one. And, and they'll, they'll give you a suggestion of what they think it might be, especially if you add a picture, which I recommend that you do. You can, with every eBird report, you can just add a little cell phone snapshot of the bird and that will help you uh, get corrected. One of the best ways to learn is, that, is to go ahead and um, make mistakes and have someone point out yeah, that's not quite a Cassin's finch. That's actually a house finch. And you learn the difference between those two birds that way when people point it out. It may not be the most pleasant play, way to learn, but, but it is one of the better ways to learn. Uh, some people still use spreadsheets. Uh, looking at the list up there, I still use a lot of spreadsheets because I'm old. But uh, most people still just use the online stuff. They still keep lists. One of the differences between a bird watcher and a birder is that almost all birders keep some kind of list, even if they just keep it in their head. And the list it can be a life list. That means all the birds you've ever seen in your life, a country list, maybe all the birds you've seen in the United States, all the birds you've seen in Oregon, all the birds you've seen in Deschutes County, or all the birds that you've seen in your own yard. Uh, all those are lists that mo many birders take. Uh, I have uh, I have all of those lists plus a bunch of other lists. Um, I have lists for all of the all of the counties in Oregon and uh, all of the states in the United States and a bunch of different countries and stuff. So I keep a lot of lists just because it's fun for me to do that. You can buy commercial listing programs. Um, I think eBird's better than all of them, but uh, uh, there is especially one called Thayer uh, Birding Program which you can buy, it's pretty expensive, but uh, it does allow you to keep your own lists and it has little quizzes on it and stuff. So it is pretty good. Uh, as I mentioned before, eBird is a citizen science uh, made simple kind of a, a thing. It's free, it doesn't cost anything at all. You just, you do have to sign up and you do have to register, but you don't have to give a credit card number or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's all free and then you can uh, go to work uh, contributing to uh, the bird science around the world. And then we have two uh, listservs in Oregon that, that I'll draw your attention to. We have more than two for sure, but these are the two that are, are important to Central Oregonians. Uh, one is called COBOL. It stands for Central Oregon Birders Online or Central Oregon Birds Online. And uh, what it is is an email listserv essentially that you can sign up for and, the, and people will... Uh, post for daily uh, about the birds that they're seeing locally. And that's a really good way to learn as well, to see which birds are being seen as the seasons go from summer to fall into winter and then into spring, cycling back to summer. Uh, over time, you can see those birds go through these cycles and, and the same birds come and go every year. And you can find, you can learn what are the common birds that way in your area and what's not so common. Uh, OBOL is the same thing as COBOL, except for it stands for 
Oregon Birders Online, and it's the listserv for the entire state. And once you get uh, comfortable with the birds in your own area, you'll probably expand out into, into different areas throughout the state, and different uh, areas other than just Central Oregon. And when you do that, you may want to subscribe to Oregon Birders Online uh, so that you can get information about what's going on over in Clatsop County in Astoria or what's happening in Harney County down at the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, those, those two things, COBOL and OBOL, uh, give you lots and lots of information. Uh, okay, on to the next thing. Oh, wrong computer. Um, so people who start birding, uh, begin birding, often begin birding by by putting up a bird feeder and they have some interest and they, they want to see some beautiful birds. So they put up a bird feeder. Uh, oftentimes they put up a bird feeder and the very first thing that happens is nothing. And you have to understand that the birds have to have a little bit of time to be able to find the feeder. So if you're at that stage right now where you've put up your feeder and you're patiently waiting every morning and you've waited three days in a row and, they, and you haven't had anything and you're wondering what you did wrong, you did nothing wrong. It just takes a little while for those birds to, to find those bird feeders. So be a little bit patient. So I wanna I'll give you a couple of basic bird uh, feeder ideas, our basic bird feeder techniques, and then a little bit about water as well at the end. So let's start at the beginning here. Start with a basic bird feeder. You can buy any bird feeder. It doesn't matter at all, really. The, the one thing that I might uh, say is that you wanna buy a bird feeder that's easy to clean because you wanna clean it fairly frequently. If you can clean it once a week, that's great. Uh, I never seem to get around to mind doing it that often, but um, once or twice a week, I mean, sorry, once a week or once every two weeks, uh, you wanna clean those things off because they do, the feeders themselves can carry diseases as the different birds come and feed, they'll drop off uh, spores and uh, bacteria and different kinds of things that, uh, that may be able to spread disease from one bird to another. So you wanna to try to keep your bird feeders clean. But other than that, if you can keep it clean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's a house style feeder, a covered feeder, a tube feeder, a sock feeder, none of those things matter. And that is what's inside the feeder. We'll get to that in a second. But, uh, but the shape of the feeder really doesn't matter very much. Rule number two is don't buy mixed seed. Don't buy seed that is black and yellow and white and red. And it looks really good, and that's why it's that way. It, 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 it's it, it's sold because not of it's good for birds, not because it's nutritious, not because it will attract birds to your yard. It's sold because it's shiny on the shelf, and you will buy it. So stay away from that mixed seed. Th those seeds that are that are different colors are generally not preferred by birds, by our local birds anyway, and uh, and they're often just wasted on the ground. So if, when you're buying seeds, you want to concentrate on two colors. You want to you want to concentrate on buying black seeds, and you want to concentrate on buying yellow seeds. If you buy both of those seeds, then you're going to maximize the number of birds that come to your bird feeders. The next rule, number three, is is very important though. Black seeds go in the air, so you want to feed black seeds in bird feeders that are hanging in the air, either hanging on a branch. From a tree or hanging on uh, some kind of a post that you've uh, that you've placed out in a bird feeding area or something like that. But get a feeder where it's up in the air. There are birds that prefer to feed from a perch in an elevated position, and those birds prefer to feed on black seeds. Uh, we'll talk about which which black seeds in just a second. But just a, the general rule here is black seeds in the air. And then rule number four is yellow seeds on the ground. You don't really need to invest. I don't think anyway. Some people do. But I don't think you need to invest in, in a whole bunch of ground box feeders or anything. I simply throw my feed out on the ground just like you feed the chickens every morning. And, uh, and that attracts those birds that, that like the yellow seeds. Black seed birds are birds like finches. Finches love black, black seeds. Some, some of the jays love the black seeds. Uh, the birds that like the yellow seeds are birds like sparrows. Now that includes the house sparrow, unfortunately, and the house sparrow is a bit of a pest, but uh, you kind of have to uh, pick your battles that way. Some people don't like house sparrows and they don't want them. And if you don't want house sparrows, then don't feed yellow seeds. But if you don't mind a few house sparrows and you want other kinds of sparrows to increase the number of birds that come to your yard, 
black seeds in the air, yellow seeds on the ground. You can't go wrong. Uh, black seeds are black sunflower and especially Nigel thistle or Niger thistle, not Nigel. Niger thistle is uh, just thistle seed. It's black thistle seed and you buy it from the store. It's pretty expensive. So if you're starting out and you just have one feeder and I wouldn't get a, a Niger thistle feeder because it's pretty, the feed is a little expensive, but uh, black sunflowers is better. It's much cheaper and the birds like it a lot. So you're not going to lose that many species. There are specialized species that really love, love the black thistle though, the Niger thistle. Uh, birds like goldfinches really love Niger thistle and you'd hate to miss out on those. Ideally, you have a black sunflower feeder and a Niger thistle feeder and then you can cover your bases that way. The yellow seeds are things like millet, cracked corn, chicken scratch. Uh, chicken scratch is just chicken feed that you can buy from the feed store. I get my 40 pound bags of chicken feed. Uh, I don't know, they cost under $20 anyway. And uh, because, and the reason I buy it, chicken feed is because the chicken feed is, is formulated to, to be nutritious and help the chickens grow. And, and uh, the other seed that you buy in the stores is tend, tends to be formulated to simply get you to buy it doesn't really have anything to do with nutrition. The chicken feed is good quality feed. And so I, I go to the, to the feed stores and I buy the chicken scratch. Uh, but some people like cracked corn and that's good. Cracked corn is just tends to be in bigger chunks and the smaller birds can't eat it very well. And millet is the, probably one of their birds favorites. They love millet, but millet's a little more expensive. So it depends on what your abilities are. If you can, if you can afford it, then feed millet on the ground. Uh, if you uh, can afford cracked corn, uh, that's probably the next best thing. And uh, and then if you, uh, if well, if you just want to give a nice rounded uh, diet with the yellow seed, then just feed the chicken scratch. That's what I do. Uh, next up on the feed is the is suet cakes. Now suet is animal fat uh, mixed with seeds, typically, or some kind of flavorings. Be a little bit careful. They, these little millet cakes come in little cakes that are about three inches square and uh, three or four inches square. And you, you put them in little specialized feeders. The little feeders themselves are very inexpensive. They cost about $3. The little cakes, so you can get them on sale for a dollar a piece. So they're not very expensive. It, it really benefits you to feed these suet cakes because the animal fat that they have is really high in energy and the birds love it. It's one of the things that will bring birds to your, to your uh, uh, feeders more than anything else. Unfortunately, uh, European starlings love suet cakes more than anything else and, and European starlings are pests. And so you're, you're gonna be getting some starlings probably. Uh, well, you, you may have to do what I do, which is I feed cakes for a while, then I quit feeding cakes for a while and the starlings go away. Then I feed them for a while, they come back and I, I just play this little game with the starlings all the time. But uh, I would encourage you to try suet cakes and see if it works for you because they're very, very good at, at, at attracting birds. Um, be a, you can be a little cautious about uh, uh, marketing here with the suet cakes as well. They, they have all, you know, if you go to the feed stores or uh, go to the co-ops, uh, they'll have 20 different kinds of, of millet, I mean, of uh, suet cakes, different flavors and anything. What you should probably know is the secret that, that the marketing people don't want you to know is that birds have very little, uh, very few taste buds and they have almost no sense of smell. And that's true for almost all birds, not all of them but almost all birds have almost no sense of smell. So, so all of these flavors that they send are they, they're trying to catch your eye. It's not gonna do anything to catch the bird's eye. In fact, you could make your own suet. Um, if you, I wouldn't recommend you doing it without going online and checking for a good solid uh, reputable rep, uh, uh, recipe, but um, you, you can just make your own suet out of animal fat or lard or something like that. You can do that very easily. Uh, and it doesn't have to have any flavoring, especially things like orange flavored and uh, raspberry, you know, just knucklehead stuff like that. Don't let them fool you. They're just trying to sell you something. Uh, plain old suet cakes work just fine. All right. Uh, ho hopefully some people will have some more questions about feeding. I will tell you that the last uh, sentence there says, 
water is just as important in food as food here in Central Oregon, especially now, from the middle of June until the end of September, uh, we have very little rainfall and very little uh, water is available to those birds out in the wild unless you provide it for them. Some of them don't need the water. Interestingly, many of our native birds don't drink water at all. They get the water directly that they need directly from their food. But a lot of them do need water. And so when you provide water, not only do you attract a set of birds with the feed, then you attract even more birds with a nice little water feature. And uh, I think the combination of putting out a little bird seed and uh, having a little water feature will give you really good results with drawing birds to into your yard. Once you get done, uh, sorry, I'm scratching my nose so much. It's just itching. Um, once you get uh, kind of used to the birds that come to your bird feeder, you're only going to get maybe 10 to 15 birds, species of birds that come to your bird feeders over the year. So after a while, you get kind of bored with, well, I'm seeing the same 10 birds all the time. And then you want to expand out. And well, and so people will say, well, what should I do next? Which group of birds should I go to after I get good at identifying my uh, feeder birds? And I always tell people the same thing. Go to the ducks. The ducks are the next place you definitely want to go. And there, there are two reasons, really. One is that the ducks acclimate to humans pretty well. So you can get relatively close, at least close enough to where binoculars will help you anyway. And they, the second thing is that they're absolutely gorgeous. And, and they're, they're very brightly colored. Uh, all of the birds that you're looking at right here in front of me in this slide are all males. And in the ducks, most of the ducks anyway in the world, are the males are very brightly colored because their one sole purpose is to attract the female and mate with her. And then the, uh, the female's job is to uh, mate with the male and then go raise the young. And she has to sit on the eggs on a nest. She can't afford to be bright red or blue or purple or anything. So most of the females are very dull colored. But the males make up for it and just being absolutely gorgeous. And so they have these bright, bright colors that make identification much easier than some of the smaller birds. So my suggestion is when you first start is to, to uh, put up some bird feeders, work on your identification skills a little bit, work on using your binoculars and using your field guide. And once you have the birds in your yard down pretty well, then go to a park somewhere that has ducks. Um, I'll, I'll show you some of the places to go a little bit later in the presentation, uh, but we have some places that you can go get some really good close-up looks at, at uh, ducks uh, that, that are used to human beings, and you can uh, walk right up on them. Uh, let's see, I think that's probably going. After, after the ducks, you know, then you can go in a lot of different ways. A lot of people go to the raptors next because they like hawks, and so they learn how to identify the hawks and the eagles which sounds like that would be easy, but it's not. Um, some people dive right into the owls. Some people go for the songbirds, the birds that sing. Uh, you know, it just, it just depends. Uh, you know, I will tell you they're not all equal. Uh, some, spe some groups of uh, birds are harder to identify than, than others, and you'll learn what those are if you stick with it. So what do you do when you're out there uh, looking for birds and, and how do you do it? That's the, the, there are a lot of big mistakes. And one of the biggest mistakes I see with beginners is that they think that the binoculars is the, are their best tool and they're not. Your binoculars are not your best tool. Your two best tools are your eyes and your ears. Uh, and one of the big mistakes that people make is that they, uh, as soon as, they, as soon as they notice a bird, they immediately bring their binoculars up to their eyes and they try to search for the bird. And the reality is you're better off using your eyes, which are better at picking up dis, uh, objects from a distance. You're better off using your eyes and gathering some information first before you put your binoculars uh, to your eyes. So the first thing you do is you look for movement. You try to look for something that's moving and then you try to... You, uh, you try to uh, you know, localize that bird and try to make sure that you under, well, you know kind of where it is before you start raising your binoculars and start searching for it. As soon as you raise, raise your binoculars, your field of view, which means that the area that you can see, shrinks way down. 
And so if you're not looking directly at that thing with the binoculars or pointing the binoculars right at the bird, you won't see anything at all and you get very frustrated. So find the bird first by looking for movement, seeing it with your, with your naked eye, and then use your binoculars. Use the eyes first, binoculars second. And then the next thing you want to do is find a reference point. So when I see a, let's say I see a crow on a, on a fence post, I don't want to go for the crow because it might be a little hard to find. I'm going to go for the fence post. I'm going to find the fence post first and then follow the fence post up to the top to get the crow. In the upper right-hand corner there, we have a, a bird called a Wilson snipe. A lot of people don't think that snipe are real, but the, the, it's, a snipe is really a bird. We have them here. Um, this picture of the Wilson snipe was taken just a couple of miles from my house. And uh, it's, it's a fairly common bird, but very well camouflaged so people don't see it very often um, but that guy right there when i go to photograph that bird or if i go to see it with binoculars uh, sometimes it's a little hard there's a lot of fence posts around so when you first raise your binoculars you don't know which one to look at so i always find the fence post because it's much bigger than a snipe and i find the fence post and focus in on the fence post and then find the snipe it takes just a half a second longer but you're much more successful and you don't have to hunt and peck around. So find a reference point. Sometimes it's a whole tree. If you, someone says there's a bird at the top of that, of that leafy tree over there, it's the only tree that has leaves and you start searching around uh, that uh, for that tree, it might take you three or four or five seconds to find the tree itself. Uh, and and it, in that case, it's gonna take you a long time to find the bird. But if you just look for the bird first, you may have to hunt for seven or eight or nine or 10 seconds to find the bird without finding the tree first. So find that big, large reference points first and then narrow it down. Uh, raise your binoculars. Uh, most people bring their binoculars directly up to their eyes and start hunting around for a bird. The best thing to do is to bring the binoculars just below your eyes. So I have a pair of binoculars somewhere right here. And so if I took my glass, when I go to, if you can see my picture here, when I go to find a bird, I bring my binoculars just below my eyes. If you can see my eyes like this, and then I can use my eyes to aim my binoculars right at the bird. And then I just slowly raise my binoculars right up to my eyes, and I'm looking directly at the bird. This is mostly important for the first year of using the binoculars. After you use binoculars for a year, and some people it's only a few months, and they get the hang of it. But uh, when you're first beginning to use binoculars, that's a really good technique to use because it just cuts down on having to hunt and search for these birds that are little and they're moving around all the time too. So once again, when you, when you first begin with binoculars and you wanna look at something, put the binoculars right below your eyes, use your eyes and kind of aim like you're aiming a, a gun if you've ever shot a gun before and kind of point the binoculars at what you're aiming at Raise the binoculars up to your eyes and you'll be right on the bird that you're looking for. And uh, that's how you use those binoculars. And that's how you spot the birds. Next thing you can do as a beginner and one of the most important things you can do is uh, bird with other people. Bird with other people that know what they're doing. Uh, and we have a couple of really nice organizations locally uh, that have a ton of volunteers that will take you out and show you birds in the field. And uh, one of them is called the East Cascades Audubon Society. That's the Audubon Society of Bend, essentially. And uh, it's got a wonderful website. You can Google East Cascades Audubon Society, or you can go to EC, which is short for East Cascades, ecaudubon.org, and uh, open that website up. And it just has, uh, you know, a thousand things in there that you can, that are bird related and are designed to help you uh, beginning birders to to learn better and, and to learn more about birds and to find more birds. Uh, they have uh, field trips all the time. They have, well, you know, COVID has knocked every, everything down a little bit, but we're starting to come back now. We're starting to do field trips again. Before COVID, we did weekly field trips every Wednesday. And uh, in the warmer months in June, July, August, September, even October, we would do weekend field trips uh, at the East Cascades Audubon Society. Um, I think that's gonna start up again here quite soon. I know the once a week Wednesday trips have already started. So contact the East Cascades Audubon Society through that website. 
and uh, and look up field trips and it'll give you information about how to get get involved with that it's the best way the best way to learn how to go birding is to go birding with somebody that already knows how to do it and they can show you uh if you happen to live in primeville we have our own local uh primeville bird club i'm the one that runs the primeville bird club because i live in crook county and uh we do kind of the same thing that east cascade audubon does, does in smaller ways anyway some of the same things anyway we do have a, a monthly field trip we do have a weekly program by the way east cascades audubon society every uh, third thursday does a an evening program they usually did it at the environmental center before covid now they do uh zoom meetings like this one and um so you can get involved in that as well uh, or you can sign up for the primeville bird club you can uh, we, we have a facebook page primeville bird club or you can email me my email address is on the first slide of this presentation and if you want to join the primeville bird club and then we have migratory bird festivals we have bird festivals around the state there's one a really nice one in in klamath falls uh, every year there's uh but the 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 harney county migratory bird festival is the largest of them and uh, really a lot of fun and something you should consider. Uh, again, post COVID, uh, they didn't have it this year. They didn't have it last year. Uh, we have our own local festival called the Woodpecker Festival, Dean Hale Woodpecker Festival. And um, you go, well, how can you have a festival just about woodpeckers? Well, we, we get over 120 species of birds every year at that festival. So it's a great place to go out and see a whole bunch of local birds. And uh, that's in June, but again, uh, hopefully in 2022, we'll be able to start that festival back up. Where can I go birding if I'm just a beginner? Well, there are a couple of really nice spots here, depending on where you live or how much you want to travel. But um, uh, one of the, pla the places, if you live in Bend, the best birding place in, in all of Bend is called Hatfield Lake. If you don't know where that is, it's out by the airport. Uh, it's actually the Bend Sewage Treatment Facility, settling ponds for the tr sewage treatment facility. Now that sounds really bad, but really sewage treatment facilities are the best places to go birding. So, because there's a lot of food at those facilities. And uh, so they, they attract a lot of birds. And the one at Bend, uh, you know, people get put off by it being a, a sewage treatment place. They think it's going to smell real bad. It doesn't smell, to my sensitivities anyway, it doesn't smell at all. Uh, and that's true for the primal sewage plant and the Redmond sewage plant as well. Um, I, I will tell you that they just closed the Primeville uh, sewage treatment facility uh, due to a, a, some kind of a problem there. And it's, so it's closed for the uh, foreseeable future anyway. But the Redmond facility is available, but the Redmond facility has re restricted access. You have to sign up uh, to be able to go out there and essentially to sign up, you have to you have to contact me and again my email address is on the front slide and i can get i can give you through the paperwork so that you can go out and, and see birds they're just really good places to get fairly close to good birds and work on your id skills there's a little place called fireman's lake in redmond which has some people call it fireman's pond and it's kind of over on the uh, east side of town the east side of highway 97 as it goes through redmond and it's just a nice little spot. In midsummer, it's not particularly active, but the rest of the year in the fall and the winter and the spring, there are lots and lots of different kinds of ducks. And again, remember those ducks are the ones we wanna work on after you learn your birds that come to your bird feeders. Uh, and it's a great place to go and learn those birds. All the parks around Bend, Sawyer Park, Shevlin Park, the Old Mill Trail, uh, the River Trail, all kinds of, uh, uh, any place where you can access nature in Bend uh, is a good place to go and look for birds. If you live in Sisters or you can travel to Sisters, the whole city of Sisters is a bird haven. It has all those big pine trees that, and birds love that. Subtle Lake is a great place, has a nice trail all the way around it. Uh, if you want some adventure and you have a car that can travel on a dirt road, then Forest Road 11 goes uh, north uh, from Indian Ford Campground. Uh, just west of Sisters, and uh, you can find all kinds of uh, wonderful birds out there on Forest Road 11. Uh, in in Primeville, uh, there's a relatively new wetlands opened about four years ago called the Crooked River Wetlands. Most of you have probably never been there, 
but it's definitely worth the trip over to Primeville because this has become one of the hottest spots in, in Central Oregon to find birds. And now that this wetland has well opened up, it's been attracting some wonderful, crazy birds uh, to the Crooked River wetlands in Primeville. And again, you can Google all these areas and find out how to get to them. Or you can go on the uh, Birding Oregon site guide, which is a, a web page that I created that has over 1,100 different places to go birding in Oregon. It's worth bookmarking that spot anyway, even if you don't end up being a birder, it has 1,100 really cool places to go in Oregon. And it gives you specific directions on how to get there, gives you maps, it gives you um, GPS coordinates, all kinds of really good stuff. So it's worth uh, bookmarking that website right there anyway, just to, to see some very wonderful places in Oregon. That's where you should go. Uh, next question is when should you go? When should you go birding? And and there are two answers to that question. It depends on uh, what level the question is at. Uh, if if you're talking about what time of day, uh, morning is way 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 one more way better than afternoon or evening. Uh, afternoon is the low, the slowest part of the day. The birds don't like to feed in the the heat of the day. Uh, birds will knock off usually in the summertime. Most of our birds completely shut down by 11 o'clock. And between 11 o'clock and four o'clock, you're probably not going to see hardly any birds around. And, uh, but, and then a little bit after four o'clock, you'll see some activity. But if, if you really want to go out and bird and you want to see a variety of birds, you need to bird in the morning. And you need to bird from sunrise to about 11 o'clock. And that's in, in June, you know, that's still lots of hours, right? That's almost a full day, sunrise to 11 o'clock, if you want to get up that early. But the earlier you can go, the better off you're going to be. As far as what time of year, spring and fall are the two best times of the year because we have migrants that move through. So the number of species that we have in our area, you know, we have a group of birds that live here year round. And that's, and there are sort of our hometown birds. But then we, every year in the spring and in the fall, we have hordes of migrants that move through. And that doubles or triples the number of species that we have in, in our area. And so uh, spring and fall are really the two best times to see a wide variety of birds. And you can go to some of those places that I mentioned before in the spring, uh, you know, Shevlin Park on a spring morning, you can see a lot of migrant birds. It's really a lot of fun. Um, the bird, the two birds that we're looking at here on this slide, the one on the left is actually a photo I took uh, of a western screech owl uh, sitting on a lady's uh, hanging, uh, you know, I don't know what they call it, hanging flower basket uh, hangers right there. That little owl was sitting on, the, on her hanging basket hook. Uh, just sitting there spending the day trying to look like a, a, you know, a stump or something and doesn't realize that he kind of stands out a little bit. And that was just a few miles from my house in Powell Butte. The bird on the right is the sage thrasher. Uh, and that bird is common out in the, the sagebrush areas of, of the drier areas uh, east of Bend. Now we're getting towards the end here, and uh, and the question is, well, then why do you do all this stuff? Why do you go birding? And and I want I want to show you a picture of some of my friends over here on the right, uh, to just to show you that really birding is you might not even realize it, you wouldn't think of it as as a social event, but it really is. Uh, this is how we socialize. This is how we get groups of you know what are there 15, 20 people in that group right there, and they're all together for one purpose, and that's to go out and try to find birds. On a, on a nice crisp morning somewhere in central Oregon. And so I, I look at it as a social activity. I enjoy going with other people. I like to take people birding. And I like to, to uh, go with groups and, and find out because we just have a good time together. If you don't like that, if you're a loner, I understand there are times when I, my favorite thing is to go up in the top of the Ochocos by myself and find birds all day long. It's my favorite thing to do. Uh, if you're a loner, then birding can be an individual thing. You can do it all by yourself. Some of my best friends don't socialize with other birders at all. They simply do it themselves because it brings them joy. And the best thing is it gets you, or one of the best things is it gets you outdoors. And then the other thing that's really good is that birding is just simply fun and gives us a lot of joy. Uh, finally here, uh, overcome your fear, forget your insecurities, 
realize you're going to make lots of mistakes. Just know that going in, uh, a whole beautiful world awaits you. And your final step is simply dive in and begin birding. Uh, the top reason to go birding is, oh, well, let me show you. I'm going to show you about 20 top reasons to go birding. So originally, I think we'd planned on uh, having you guys enter in the chat box if there's anyone that knows the names of these birds. But we, that might be too slow. I think we're just going to go through. Let me just go ahead and go through uh, some of these birds. Now, I threw the these birds on the end here, uh, photos of some birds that I have around my house, because um, I wanted people to be able to use uh, this little presentation with their field guides as practice. So in the coming months, um, review this, uh, this YouTube video a little bit, uh, a few times, use your field guide and practice identifying some of the birds from these slides. And that'll, that'll, that'll kind of get you uh, a little leg up on some of the other friends that don't get to practice on a, on a nice uh, YouTube video. So let me show you some Central Oregon birds. Again, most of these are, uh, well, are all my pictures, but most of them come from my yard. So I'll, I'll point out the ones that don't. This is a Western tanager, a male Western tanager. It's actually a first year male Western tanager, I can tell, because it has little scale uh, on the shoulders. They're little green scales that the adults don't have. But uh, this is one of our most beautiful birds, yellow head, yellow, I mean, sorry, yellow body, red head, and dark wings like that. That's the Western tanager. Uh, I threw this bird on here just because I wanted to mix things up a little bit. This is a, a blue whistling thrush. And this picture was taken in, in Thailand. So it wasn't taken in my backyard. Uh, but I, I threw it in here just to show you that, that I don't just spend my time birding here. I also get to enjoy the birds of the world. And uh, we went to Thailand this year just before COVID broke out last, actually last winter or the winter before. And so we made it just in time to get to Thailand and back before they closed the country down. Uh, so that's a beautiful little bluebird that we found in Thailand. Another bluebird though, that you can get right here in Central Oregon, right in Bend, is called the Pinion Jay. And uh, one of my favorite birds, it's very, very noisy and it'll eat you out of house and home, but you gotta love them because they're just gorgeous. Uh, we talked, uh, uh, we, we were talking about uh, red-headed wood, red headed woodpeckers earlier in, in a discussion, and uh, I mentioned the red-breasted sapsucker. That's what this bird is right here. Some people think it's a red-headed woodpecker, but it's really not. There is a bird called a red-headed woodpecker, but this is not him. This one has a red head, so it's uh, understandable that people mistake that for a red-headed woodpecker. But this is the red-breasted sapsucker. Drills little holes in the bark and eats the sap from the tree. Uh oh, wrong computer. Ah, you got to love this bird. This is the lazuli bunting, La or some people call it the lazuli bunting or lazuli bunting. It's pronounced many, many different ways. But uh, a gorgeous little blue and orange bird that we get uh, in the spring, in the summer, in the fall. Lazuli bunting. Told you before that the ducks are gorgeous. Uh, this is a duck called the northern shoveler because it has this big shovel shaped bill has a big red brick on its side and a green head and uh just a gorgeous old guy that i took at the primeville sewer ponds uh, a couple of years ago we have two kinds of bluebirds i have pictures of both of them this is the western bluebird has a blue body and a red belly we have uh, lots of hawks in central oregon we even have east cascade audubon society sponsors a statewide uh winter raptor survey and you can volunteer. You don't have to have any experience at all. You can volunteer and ride along with the, the surveyors as they count winter raptors. It's just a blast. I would recommend it to anyone. This particular uh, bird is called a red-tailed hawk, but it's a special kind of red-tailed hawk called a Harlan's hawk. Uh, very nice. This is a uh, black neck stilt. One of the birds we call shore birds lives on the shore. This is a yellow-headed blackbird. It's called a yellow-headed blackbird because it's a blackbird with a yellow head. And, a, and a, people look at me funny when I say that because I, every year someone comes up to me and goes, what's the name of the bird that has a yellow head and is black? And I said, it's a yellow-headed blackbird. This is a yellow bird with a little different color combination. This is a yellow-breasted chat. 
has just yellow on the chin and the chest, not on the belly, not on the back. This little bird uh, called a varied thrush. And we get a few varied thrushes in the spring and the fall. And our orange and black bird is the oriole. Uh, this is the northern or, or the bullock's oriole. It used to be called the northern oriole. It's not, it's not a Baltimore oriole. That's a different bird, but, uh, but it's related very closely to the Baltimore oriole. Uh, this bird is not taken near my yard. It's actually taken clear out in Polina, uh, but it's a bird called a bobolink. It's widespread throughout the continent, except for it doesn't like Oregon very much for some reason. So it sort of stops right at Polina, and we don't see them very often very, any closer to Bend than that. When you study birds a little bit, you'll, you'll see that many of them have very strange adaptations. This bird's called a crossbill. This is the red crossbill. And Red crossbills eat uh, pine seeds and fur seeds. And that, that, that bill is specially designed to be able to jam the bill into a pine cone and then open its bill a little bit and it creates pressure and the seed pops right out of the cone, right, right into their mouth. So it's a really cool looking bird. Gotta love the owls, everybody loves the owls. This is the pygmy owl, the Northern pygmy owl. And the northern pygmy owl is the smallest bird in Oregon. Uh, the smallest, sorry, the smallest owl in Oregon, not the smallest bird, but the smallest owl in Oregon. He's only about the size of a sparrow, maybe a little bit fatter than a sparrow, but he's a little tiny guy. And he's active during the day. He's not so much a night hunter as the most as the other owls are. He can't really hunt at night because the other owls eat him all the time if he does. So he he hunts during the daytime. Some of the hawks are just gorgeous. This is one of my favorite photos. This is a rough-legged hawk. Uh, it's almost completely white on the top, dark in the belly and white on the tail. Looks like a reverse Oreo cookie. American goldfinch, one of our common birds that loves that black Niger thistle that we talked about, the black seed hanging in the air. You might get that bird at your yard. This is the black-headed grosbeak. It comes to you through mostly as a migrant in our yards in Central Oregon. The evening grosbeak also comes through as a migrant. But evening grosbeaks can be here any time of the year. They're a little bit of a nomad. They, they would wander around for sure. I mentioned we had two blur, bluebirds. This is the mountain bluebird. You can get that right in your backyard if you live out in, the, in some of the open areas around Bend. Uh, the water birds that aren't ducks are typically not as colorful, but they can still be really interesting looking. This is a bird called a, a Clark's Greed. And um, if you want to ha have an interesting experience, um, go to Google and, and type in Clark's Greed dancing and uh, you're going to get a treat because they, they do an incredible mating dance. We have a whole little set of little birds called warblers. This is called McGilvery's warbler. It's just one of maybe a dozen different kinds of warblers that we get here in Oregon. And it's just a little tiny yellow bird. Most of them warblers are yellow. And this one has a gray head with the little, little half moon or crescent moons on the top and the bottom of its eye. That's McGilvery's warbler. Uh, I, I was hoping to be able to do this as a sort of a, uh, a quiz because I don't know if people would know what this is, but it's a pheasant, a ring neck pheasant. Many people know what ring neck pheasants are, but this, this happens to be a bird called a leukistic ring neck pheasant. And if you're leukistic, it means you're almost an albino. You'll notice that this bird doesn't have pink eyes and that would make it an albino, but almost the rest of it's completely without pigment. So it has color problems anyway. Leukistic means whitish. Uh, my sister-in-law called me up this winter when it snowed quite a bit and she said, I have a baby owl in my barn. And I know that in the wintertime, there are no baby owls. Baby owls are born in the spring. So uh, that means that one of our small owls, we have almost a dozen, uh, about 10 or 11 species of owls in, in Oregon, in Central Oregon. And one of them is called this, the saw wet owl. And this is a little saw wet owl. It's only about maybe the size of your fist. And uh, this one was sitting in my, in my sister-in-law's barn right above where her chickens are. He wasn't even anywhere close to as big as the chickens, so the chickens weren't in danger, but he was after the mice that were after the chicken feed. 
So uh, sometimes you'll get these little small owls around your place. Uh, it's really fun to go out in the forest and call for these birds because they sound much bigger than they really are. For sure. Jack, how, how far away were you when you took this picture? I, I mean, that is, that's an extraordinary photo. I had to zoom all the way out and uh, just to get, just to try to get this thing in the frame because he was about three feet away from me. Do you use a, a camera camera or do you use your phone? No, I used my big, my, I had my big lens because I didn't know how far away it was going to be. But when we, when I stuck my head and I didn't want to scare him. So I went very slow and I stuck my head and I looked around, I couldn't find him. Then I looked directly above me and he was just right there above the door. And so I just stuck my camera up, took a couple of shots. And one of them was this one right here. That bird has a lot of personality. Yeah, that's a great bird right there. And that's all I have. There's some birds from Central Oregon, some ways to get started if you're a beginner. Get out there and go birding and, and contact the uh, local bird clubs and, and get going with other people and have a great time. I hope you have some questions. So, Chuck, why don't you go ahead and stop your screen share? Uh, somebody did mention um, suet can melt in the heat. <laughs> Had to scrub one off my deck after forgetting about the suet feeder on the deck. Yeah, but I didn't hear you. Suet does what in the heat? Suet melts in the heat. Yeah. yeah. And so, so you got to be careful where you put that. And that's, and that's one of the advantages of buying commercial suet because commercial suet really, really handles the heat pretty well. Uh, I've never had commercial suet heat or uh, melt out in, in nature. If I make my own suet balls, then that can be a real problem for sure because lard yes. will melt uh, at a pretty low temperature. It, yeah. Homemade suet balls are really a winter thing for two reasons. One, they'll melt in the summer. Two, they'll go bad birdie. They don't have the, the preservatives that the, that the store bought suet has as well. So right. yeah, yeah, know that, uh, know that suet's going to be a real sticky, uh, a sticky thing and, and uh, can have its own little problems, but it's, it's kind of worth it because it brings in a lot of birds. Uh, okay. So we have a question from Chris and Chris wants to know, do you account for male and female birds in your list or just count the species? Some people do one and, and some people do the other. If you use eBird, eBird has the ability to have just count the number of birds that you see, or you can count the number of males and the number of females. In, a, in about a quarter of the species, uh, well, more than a quarter, almost half of the species, the males and the females look very similar. They're very difficult to tell apart, uh, but uh, some of them are quite easy. Uh, even a male robin is, is very similar to a female robin, but most people, after they see a few robins, and tell them apart. Um, but some of them are difficult. But if you want to, and, and you want to keep track of that kind of thing, it's good because that's that's useful information. Not not all the birds, uh, for example, a lot of the birds, once they get done mating, um, they'll, they'll go to different places in the fall. They'll split up and the males will go one place and the females will go another place. So they don't go to, together. Um, that happens with quite a few species actually. Yeah, thank you. So it's it's really interesting. I'll give everybody a, oh, here comes a question from Barr. Um, is there a particular birding book that you find the most useful? I think you mentioned yeah. earlier. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you mean a birding book or a, a field guide book. Um, uh, um, not specified, so I, it just- That's maybe okay. That's okay. Yeah, I, I think, uh, there are a couple things. One is, uh, uh, one is if you're talking about field guide, I think the Sibley guide is the most complete guide to buy. Uh, and it's, it's the most popular guide as well. The Sibley field guide to birds of the West. That's the best thing. If you're talking about a birding book though, I'm just going to look over uh, my so follow-up question is a bird ID book. Yeah. A bird ID book is a field guide. And, mm -hmm. and so the Sibley guide is, is the best thing. I was going to do a pitch for, uh, I don't know if I have the copy of that book here with me right now. Um, there is a local author that wrote a very nice bird book, uh, and I just don't see it. I was going to advertise it, but uh, that, that talks about not just bird identification, but also bird biology and migration and habits and features and all kinds of things. So, so just go to your bird local bird store if you want to buy a bird book. They have a whole section of field guides and bird related books. I think the library probably has a good selection. Also. Oh yeah, no, never mind. Don't go to the don't go to the store. <laughs> no, we're all about supporting local business. But if you're if people want to, you know, test out what they might like, <laughs> do know that at the library and then go. 
purchase no one. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, so just uh, as a, let me make, sh make sure I got all the questions answered. I think I did, I think we did. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Hatfield Lake. Yeah. We actually, you know, we're starting to do some programming in person. Um, and one of the first programs that we've organized is a birding field trip at Hatfield Lake. Oh, you're gonna love it. With Damien so Fagan's gonna lead that. Yeah, and Damien's great. You'll love Damien as well. Um, uh, so the thing, if you, if many people have never been to Hatfield Lake and Hatfield Lake, because it's a, a sewage treatment facility, they, they shy away from that. But again, there, you, you, don't, you don't come in contact with that water in any way. The trail that goes around keeps you away from the, the water quite a ways. And you need to take binoculars with you. But the trail goes all the way around the ponds. And the trail is open to the public seven days a week. And uh, I think from, from daylight till, till dawn. Uh, from daylight till sunset anyway and yeah. uh, and and you can go out there and walk around and it's, see all kinds of birds get some exercise take your dogs uh it's it's out by the police shooting range but they they've isolated that shooting range away from from public so you're not in any danger there it's it's just a lot of a lot of people go and use that some people shy away from it because of what it is but i don't think it uh, i don't think you'll if, 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 if nothing else just go try it sometime hatfield lake yeah, so people who are on the call, you're going to get some advance notice if, if you're here at the meeting tonight because um, the event is you have to register. We're limiting the number of people who are participating because of COVID, um, but it is on Tuesday, July 13th at 7.30 in the morning. Woo! We've never had a, pro a library program that early ever. Um, it is on our website on, and you need to register. So that's July 13th. Um, if you have questions, if you're on the webinar here tonight, you have questions, you can email me. But if you just go onto the library's website calendar um, and look for July 13th, you'll find the event to register. Um, yeah, 7.30 in the morning, woo! Early well, I was gonna say, you know, on July 13th, the, the birds get up about 6.15 6 in the morning. So if well. you wanna catch them, <laughs> you gotta get up early. That's I'm, I'm sure our staff person was not interested in doing that. Um, I didn't. I didn't want to make a big deal about it, but if you want to be a birder, you have to get up in the morning sometimes and and uh, shake off the the nights the the uh, sleepiness and go out there and see some birds. That's true. Um, okay, so I don't see any other questions. I think there were a couple of questions about how to sign up for the field trip, um, but I I think that's it. What a great and glorious program, and I I do really appreciate what you said about you know bring if it. it bringing you joy because I, I do love to watch birds and and there is just a real sense of wonder and joy about the diversity in 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 birds and and just watching them exist in our yards it's wonderful. right and and and, and, a, and a, one more good plug for the library because I'm sure you have a, a whole section in there about those birds go check out that section and, and educate yourself and then go out and enjoy the birds in nature you'll love it yeah, Chuck, this has been really great. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, and like Chuck mentioned, this is going to be recorded and will be on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So people will be able to share this link because this was a lot of information and really great stuff. Um, and we really appreciate you stopping by tonight to share your love of birds, Chuck. It was my pleasure. Yeah, thank you. All right, bye-bye.